Thank you, Elida. And as Elida said, we are in a desperate need to hurry up the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, to limit what is now an increasingly, and we've seen the past few months, increasingly tangible climate crisis. The IEA has uh, estimated that we need to uh, increase the annual investments in renewable energy in developing countries with seven folds in order to reach the climate goals. And as the minister said, Norfin has been in investing in renewables from the very beginning in developing countries as a vital tool to combat poverty. And with the new Climate Investment Fund, we will have increased muscles to also be part of the solution to combat the climate crisis. But increasing the investments in renewable energy at this scale requires a lot of things. One is capital, but another thing is it requires a lot of land. And this is not straightforward in any country. And in many of the markets where we are investing, it's even more complicated. So to, it often faces, we often face a lot of very concrete dilemmas. And to, to share some light on, on one concrete example I have with me, uh, Damien Berlioz, uh, Senior Investment Manager in Northern. So please take the stage. <laughs> Damien, India has become uh, one of the prioritized markets of this new climate investment fund. And you have faced some really concrete challenges with working with investments in India. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think the key challenge thus far in our journey uh, investing into India's renewable energy transition has been to strike uh, the right balance between supporting the green energy growth uh, versus nature protection. Um, we've seen quite a few solar and wind projects uh, that needed to be turned down um, because a lot of these developers uh, are developing projects uh, in sensitive critical habitats uh, in states like Rajasthan and Gujarat. A lot of this has to do with uh, the, the government uh, has ambitious targets um, to transition uh, away from coal. And it decided to remove uh, environmental and impact assessments for solar and wind projects from regulations. So all of a sudden, you, you have uh, what is going on now, which is a, a bit of a, a, a challenge and a dilemma for, for the government and environmentalists, because yeah, there's been a priority from these developers to target the desert areas where the sun shines the most um, and have least densely populated areas. The land is cheap, but that's coming at a cost to biodiversity. There are some critically endangered species there, such as the great Indian bustard. There's something like 150 of these birds left, uh, they, they're estimating out there. So. Um, it's, it's a challenge for, for Norfund to, to have, obviously we want to support that renewable energy transition, but we're also having to turn down some investments due to the biodiversity loss that's going on in, in India. Um, yeah. So how did, how did this play out in some of those concrete investments? I know you, we just uh, made public one investment in India. How, how has it gone, gone down concretely? Sure. So we've done a few things. I mean, apart, we've obviously had to turn down quite a few uh, investments um, because they are in those sensitive critical habitat zones. But um, some of the, the recent solar project that we just uh, signed a transaction with Enel Green Power, that, for instance, uh, is outside of those critical habitat zones. It's with a partner that understands also and has similar environmental social standards as us. Um, so there's a common understanding that's uh, absolutely critical. Um, and we've funded together with Enel to make sure to put bird diverters, for instance, to mitigate the impact and the risk of collision with the transmission lines. Um, on other projects, we're looking at uh, in Karnataka, where there is just a lack of data on biodiversity. So nobody, there's a lack of awareness, actually, of the loss that's going on as a result of the renewable energy transition. So we've funded with... Um, the Bombay Historical Natural Society there, some bird studies to just try and increase the, the, the data that's available uh, in the public domain so that then 
stakeholders can try and mitigate or at least be aware of w what the impacts uh, are of these renewable energy projects, whether they're wind turbines or the transmission lines. Great. Yeah, so you mentioned that the, the Indian government, they, I mean, they, they have ambitious targets. They want to increase investments. They want to boost uh, and make it more business friendly. But can a lack of regulation sometimes even uh, have the opposite effect, make it more complicated for some investors? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, it makes it more difficult for, for an institution like Norfund because you, have, you end up having a gap between the local applicable standards from environmental and, re and social regulations uh, versus our requirements. So all of a sudden, you then have to do a lot more due diligence uh, at the beginning even, and throughout your investment process um, to, to understand those risks. Um, uh, and try and find a, a balance, like I said, and try and mitigate the, the impact on biodiversity uh, as much as possible. But I think, I feel, you, you need to look also, I think, at the, from India's perspective. It makes sense that they've, they've decided to prioritize this, and I, you, you've got to understand that they've targeted the places where the sun shines the most and the wind blows the most, because they want, a, they want low cost of power too, right? Like Norway and everybody else at the moment. But, but um, so, and then if you decided to simply move those projects, um, there probably are alternative uh, impacts. Uh, either you're taking over fertile agricultural land or affecting other, other biodiversity in a negative way. So it's, it's, a, it's a dilemma uh, and it's, it's, a, it's difficult to strike the right balance. But um, from Nurfan's side, we've obviously needed to spend a lot more time to understand those risks um, and make sure that the projects that we're investing and the partners that we're partnering with are committed to try and mitigate uh, those uh, impacts as, as best we can. Mm. So we're going to hear soon from one of our ENS experts. Uh, you're not an ENS expert, but uh, as I understand, in Northern you work on this as a, as a team. Why is that important in this kind of investment? I think it goes a little bit back to what I was saying, where I think you need to have also this mindset where you need to understand where these developers and these, these governments are also coming from in order to try and boost renewables. Um, and I think we need to have uh, an open mind uh, to try and s support that renewable energy growth, but at the same time find a way to mitigate uh, some of the biodiversity loss or raise the awareness of some of the impact that these projects are having on the ground. Uh, and I think in order to do that, you need to not necessarily just focus on an individual project's negative impacts, but also try and look at the bigger picture, which I think was talked about in the previous session, to understand well, what, would what, would you ha what would be the impacts if you didn't do that project? Uh, what would be, it would be probably continue to burn coal, pollution, and, and try and think about all those different trade-offs that are going on to understand a bit better uh, the risks and how you can try and mitigate some of those and whether the project makes sense or not to invest in. Thank you very much, Damien, for setting some light on some of the dilemmas that we're facing in India. Thank Thanks. you. To further discuss these issues, we have an excellent panel with us. Uh, welcome to the stage, please. Karolina Andauer, CEO of WWF Norway. Ishita Shelaya, Group Head of Environment, Social Health and Safety in DECIS. And Marianela Gonzalez, uh, ENS Advisor in Norfun. I thought to start with you, Carolina. I mean, WWF, you are working to conserve nature, to, to restore biodiversity, but you're also very concerned about the climate and uh, about f uh, f and getting rid of fossil fuels and replacing it with renewables. How do you think about these dilemmas and, and the challenges of, 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 uh, of achieving those two goals at the same time? And, and, and the examples that Damien uh, raised here. Yeah, so what we are trying to do is secure less emission and more nature. And, and for me, it isn't a dilemma at all. It is understanding the context we are working in now uh, and how we have done our cho kind of how we have chosen to do our business so far that isn't sustainable. So if you take the bigger picture about we have to reach uh, the climate goals to kind of avoid the most extreme weather events, but we also have to take into account that we have blown the planetary boundaries. So the way we use our resources on this uh, planet is just not sustainable. 
Um, so it isn't the dilemma. The dilemma comes when you are looking into two separate things and not integrating them and understanding solving the climate crisis, you can't do without solving the nature crisis at the same time. And I think that's the aspect that investors like Norfan, but other politicians and so on, really know how to integrate. It's, it's not a dilemma on choosing between them, it's finding the solution on how to integrate them. So Ishita, you uh, work in BECIS, that's an uh, investee of Northern since 2020, and you're developing uh, distributed energy uh, and, and renewable energy directly to businesses. Yes. Uh, how, uh, what kind of challenges are, do you face when you're developing energy in, in your markets in Asia? So currently we are in eight countries uh, in uh, Asia. Um, challenges are obviously very, very country to country. Uh, and uh, some of these issues, uh, because of the nature of our business, we're primarily in the CNI sector, which is the commercial and industrial sector. Um, it's, it's very different from the grid connected projects. Uh, the bigger issues we see are mostly related to the performance standard two, worker relation issues, and educating workers on how these ESG initiatives are important both for them and the community as well as uh, to make sure that business uh, continues sustainably. So it's primarily worker-related issues and of course where we do uh, get into bioenergy projects is the sustainability of biofuels which is uh, another, another big uh, area that we have to manage uh, very, very carefully. Yes. Carolina, the, uh, this kind of a distributed energy, that's is that part of the solution, to, to, to get enough energy? Yes, I think part of the solution now is to find multiple solutions. So how, you do, how we have built up our energy in part of the Western world just can't be transferred to think that's the way we're going to develop uh, energy access in many countries. Uh, the energy need is different, as you pointed out as well, and the possible uh, projects that is most suited in the different countries are different. But I think what is dissimilar the whole time is that we know we have the challenge with the loss of nature and you can never reach the climate goals if we don't have intact nature. Can kind of nature storage so much carbon for us and that we need to reach the climate goals without even though with all of the renewable energy we could do it, we still need nature to take the carbon for us. And that's the livelihood. In many of the countries where we are now talking about big scale investments, they are living on this livelihood. They're finding natural resources. They're, that's their direct livelihood in many places. So we have to find a solution on how we can do both. Okay. Nella, as an ENS advisor in Northern, you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot of different issues. One is the biodiversity that we've been talking about, but you're, but you're also dealing with quite a lot of issues that is connected to land use in renewable energy. What, what are the most common challenges that we face? Yes, I mean, as you mentioned, we work with biodiversity and also land use and also other social issues that are related to working conditions, like Ishita was saying. But we also work with the stakeholder engagement, uh, indigenous peoples, project impacts towards communities and their livelihoods, also cultural heritage and other very complex issues that um, I believe that they tend to be very complex because these social issues, we are dealing with people. And people, when we're working with them and engaging them with them, obviously they have their specific points of views and needs. And also because the context of the geographies that we're working in as Northfront are very, very challenging. I mean, this is part of the whole discussion of, of this conference of how difficult and challenging it is to work in developing countries. And uh, I feel that uh, these contextual issues that occur at a higher country or regional level are very important to projects because they create impacts to projects, but are very challenging because usually they fall out or out or are beyond the control of a project company or a project sponsor. So that creates additional layers of complications to, to the work that we do as Norfund. And I believe that is why it is very important for us not only to take into consideration the environmental and social risks that are directly connected to a project, but also these other risks that are occurring at a higher country or regional level. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I think you're pointing on a very important aspect uh, is the civil society. For many other countries, we are now seeing investments is happening in countries with very weak governance systems. So we talked about lack of regulation previously. 
uh, and that being complicating for an investor, yes, but it is also very complicated in terms of keeping the rights on the, lo uh, the local communities that lives in many of this area. We have multiple challenges with relocations in many places. So how can we make sure that we have a strong civil society in these countries? And I think that's an um, underestimated, I think, both uh, as a topic, but also as part of those who invest. And how do you contribute to build up civil, strong civil society organizations that can help in places with weak governance, where regulation is lacking, and maybe where there are regulation, but lack of enforcement? as well when companies are breaking and are not taking into account the different things. So strengthening civil society as part of that, this <laughs> avoiding critical damage to the biodiversity when we're scaling up is key for all of investors, I think. And Nella, you have been working with quite some civil society organizations uh, as well, right? When in dialogue with these kind of issues. And in Latin America, where you are representing, uh, yes, th th this is important, isn't it? It's very important for us. I mean, uh, we try to do it uh, from Norfont, and we really encourage uh, the companies, the project companies, to do that. It's a, a requirement under the IFC performance standard frameworks. Uh, for us, it's key to be able to engage in early with the stakeholders, communities, and civil society. Uh, this has been proven throughout the years that uh, early engagement is fundamental not only for projects to obtain their environmental license during their early stages to operate, well, to build the project and then operate, but throughout the lifetime of the project, to really be able to, to have an adequate risk management. And when you engage early with communities and stakeholders, you are also sending an important me message for them that their well-being and concerns are important for the project. You're also in a perfect timing to include their feedback in early project designs. I think there are many different uh, examples that I've been involved in in the region. But two come to, to my mind. One was directly with a wind uh, project that we were building in, in Costa Rica. It was mostly the transmission line that was critical for this project because it was impacting a lot of tropical forest that it was not a protected area, but it was an important habitat. And this forest had been managed, uh, it's, it was private property, but it had been managed and preserved by a conservation foundation for many, many years. Uh, the person in charge of this foundation is an amazing scientist. He dedicated his life to preserve this forest. So it was very difficult for us to approach him and tell him that, okay, we want to build a transmission line here. It's a renewable energy project, yes, but we need to cut part of your forest. We're going to intervene. And it really took us many years of dialogue with uh, this scientist and his group of, of colleagues as well to ensure that we were able to build a transmission line that was sustainable, that was taken into consideration, all the biodiversity aspects that were needed to take into consideration. And at the end, I feel that it was very successful, challenging, it took a long time, but at the end, this foundation became a strong supporter of the project and they understood that you can definitely build renewable energy projects in the region. And another example was last year, and that was um, directly with uh, Norfund. We decided to commission a contra analysis for Colombia because it's a new country for us, and uh, we really wanted to ensure that we were understanding the environmental, social, and human rights issues that were going, in the, going on in the country with a specific focus on, on energy. But what was very important for me, to me from that exercise was the stakeholder mapping that we did and the interviews that we did to 17 people that represented governments but also civil society. And I think that that dialogue was very valuable for us in order to gain their views and really have a broader perspective of what was going on in the country. Isita, you, you mentioned briefly that in addition to solar, which is like the big, the big thing that everybody is talking about, you are using also a lot of, of biomass uh, for the, those distributed projects. Yes. Could you tell more about the, what challenges are you involved when it comes to that? And, and why do you see that as important? So, I mean, the, the issues with the CNI sector are, are vast. Now, bioenergy per se is an, is an agricultural related project where we we take byproducts or waste products from the agricultural industry. But in the whole larger system of bioenergy projects, we currently at BCIS are investing in uh, three, four countries right now, Cambodia, uh, India, Indonesia, and we're looking at Thailand also. Um, 
Each of these countries present very different challenges in the bioenergy framework itself. We are using the roundtable for sustainable uh, biomaterials as, a, as an external verification uh, process to make sure that we source uh, sustainable uh, biomaterials. Uh, but however, this one challenge that I could say is this, this uh, framework, RSB, uh, is uh, pretty limited with the, with the consultants, the reach, uh, the geographies that they have experience with. And I won't even say, uh, you know, this issue is specific to uh, the bioenergy uh, side of our operation. We generally, uh, you know, in order to do uh, good uh, IFC uh, uh, compliant projects, we need uh, good consultants, uh, good uh, ground staff uh, who are qualified to know what all this is. And this, it, it's a chicken and egg situation, you see. I mean, the uh, uh, NOR Fund uh, and all our other investors have, have put uh, certain criteria, and we ourselves want to meet a lot of these criteria, but the education journey mm -hmm. and also getting partners mm -hmm. to work with us in these countries uh, is very, very uh, challenging. Uh, we're doing our best, but it is, it is long. Um, uh, on top of that, you know, investing in companies, uh, in, in, in countries such as Cambodia versus Thailand versus uh, India, in, let's say you use, uh, whether we do a solar uh, rooftop or ground-mounted or a bioenergy project, in India you have uh, focus on waste, waste management issues. In Thailand, it's people issues. In Cambodia, it's unexploded ordinance in the ground. So your staff you, that you get need to be very, very uh, knowledgeable about the core issues in those geographies. And I, in my position, need to understand all this, and then our investors need to understand. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a journey, and it's an education back and forth. So yeah, these are the challenges we face. Uh, mm. Yeah, I know this is something you work a lot with, Carolina, and we've been in dialogue with as well. Yeah, um, and I think part of the problems, and I think we in the environmental organizations has part to blame of that, because in the beginning of the 2000s, we talked a lot about certification schemes. As long as things are certified, we will move in the right direction. But certification schemes and standards is just a tool and not the end, end goal in itself. We, but we talked about this as it was the end goal going to solve anything, which locked us into kind of really investing uh, and require that people build up skills to kind of to do reporting and doing following a specific scheme of certification and standards. But they are quite general sometimes, as you say. They are international, and they don't capture all of the local context you need. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a change in that theory of change and uh, how we are looking at it. But for me, standing here in this stage, I think one common message that I need from this community is that we see there is a lot of fast-tracking um, renewable energy. It's a lot about talk. We have to fast-track renewable energy now because we have so little time to cut emissions. But why aren't we fast-tracking, understanding where we're going to do things, data gathering, mapping, mm -hmm. finding the right um, data to map the nature, the biodiversity, local livelihoods, who are dependent on these resources, who are the stakeholders? That is not being fast-tracked. That is a minor post expected to the developers or the investors should cover uh, with uh, true consultants that they hire. But it's not kind of part of international okay, schemes in the COP or the COP in Glasgow, for example, we talked about taking care of nature, seeing it in relation with climate, but no willingness to invest. And if we're going to fast track development, not just renewable yeah. energy, but other things, why aren't we fast tracking the essence, the foundation we need in the bottom to actually do this? And we see the same here in Norway. We want to fast track now clean energy due to the energy crisis, but we're not fast tracking over the state budget uh, impact assessment, finding out kind of what data gathering do we need in order to fast track renewable, for example. And I, and I really don't get it why we don't want to invest in kind of in our livelihood, that, which is the nature and the natural resources. So I think we really need an investment community to speak up and saying that a politician should be taking part of those big meetings when they meet in Montreal to talk about the new global deal for nature in COP in Egypt. Ask them to really invest in this.
Nella, this is quite connected to, in a way, to what Damien was uh, telling about also. About, I mean, one thing is regulations, but the regulations need to be based on data mm. and information. And I mean, you're facing that in a lot of the in energy investments as well. And, and, and again, not just on biodiversity. What kind of uh, experiences do you have with good regulations and bad regulations and good available data and, and bad available data when it comes to land rights and indigenous people and, and uh, other issues that you, you're facing. Yes, I mean, I, I really like that you raised your, this point. I think data is fundamental. I mean, from our side, talking from a DFI, a development financial institution, when we're doing assessments, it would be great for us to have all this available data related to biodiversity, critical habitat, indigenous peoples, and, and other civil society actors that could raise, you know, red flags or go to areas <laughs> or no go to areas all over the world. That would make our job so much easier and would really allow us or reduce the risk to create, you know, bigger impacts. And I think it's a very strong and important measure. Uh, message that you're sending. That information is very valuable, and not only for those factors, but also for climate-related uh, decisions as well. I think there is a, a big gap, especially when you start to to try to forecast impacts on a more localized level and, and try to, to integrate them with a sector. So that is very important. And data is also connected, like you were saying, to, to regulations. I mean, uh, if you would have a stronger regulations, if you have better da data to support that decision-making. And I've seen also markets that have a strong environmental and social regulatory framework usually means that projects somehow tend to include sustainability one way or the other, not necessarily perfectly, but in a way. So at least it makes it easier, as Damien was saying, for investors like Norfund to go into these markets. Other, where other markets that are poorly regulated, it means that environmental and social risks are less likely being considered. So that actually creates a big exposure for companies to, to be exposed to reputational, regulatory, or legal threats. And in that sense, I think governments play a fundamental role in building up this uh, ENS framework in, in this specific case. And, and there are some good examples. I think South Africa was a good example in, in 2011 when they launched the, the REAP, that there is the Renewable Energy Independent Power Procurement Program. But the, the essence of this is that they, I think it was a very successful program because they tackled two issues. The first one was energy security and they wanted to attract uh, more electricity generating capacity, and they were extremely successful doing that. In, in three years after launching the, pro the project, they, they attracted a lot of investors, more than what was achieved in the entire African continent for the last 20 years. But another important thing from this program, that that's what I want to highlight, is that they included social and economical criteria in their selection process of doing mm. the bids. So the bid was weighted 70% by price, but the other 30% was weighted considering socioeconomic um, criteria. That meant that the people that were participating or the companies that were participating in the bid process had to satisfy this criteria, which was also very important. You, you could say, I mean, uh, we, we could all agree, I think, that I mean, we, sh we would want more data, more regulations, but is there an argument to me, made, Caroline, that, well, in uh, Awaiting that, it's even more necessary with investors such as Northern that can actually demand higher standards than what the, the local governments in the areas do. Oh, absolutely, but also then willing to invest in capacity building in those countries. Yes. Uh, because I think if you just think kind of demanding, um, they will may also go to other investors if you kind of come to be demanding, which we have talked about earlier as well. So it's also investing in that investment in that capacity building uh, locally. Uh, and, you, and we do have some things. We do, for example, have maps of national parks where it shouldn't be development, but it still happens because there is a need for short time kind of look pe people look for short time investments or take the easiest kind of choice when develop things because going into an area where there is no other infrastructure 
for example, there are no local communities, but really high on biodiversity seems easier than going to a place where you have to talk with a lot of other stakeholders that are currently involved in infrastructure projects, or there are like local settlements and communities that you also have to have dialogue with. And that's not, not unique for the development countries. This is kind of what we see all over, including in Norway. We have a tendency to take the easiest road, the quickest road. Um, and in addition, which we haven't talked about here, is that Carbon pricing is something everybody understands that polluters pay is part of it, and people understand that you have to take that into your cost, and that's why also looking at prognosis now, investments in renewable energy makes sense, carbon price is going to go up, but what about nature? So what do you pay as an investor, as a developer, going into a sensitive biodiversity area or area with endemic species, species that only live there? How do you calculate that cost into projects? Currently, it doesn't happen because you can't kind of monetize nature in a way. But you actually can take into account how much will it take to, for example, restore. Well, you can't restore an endemic species. So the prices going into an area risking an endemic species should be astronomically high, that it shouldn't be kind of make sense economically. But we haven't come to that stage yet. And I think that is also part of shifting, and we see it here in Norway, but also um, a board where we talk about climate risk. It's the same as kind of credit risk for many investors now, but nature risk is kind of, it's not part of the language yet in terms of taking into account in projects, what does it cost to destroy the nature in, this, in certain areas? You see that you, you were turning back to the, the whole the, like the regulation issues, and I mean, you, you, as you said, I mean, you, just investing in distributed energy for companies—that's a quite new business model. It's, it's not that many years ago yes. that this, this didn't exist. Uh, how, how do you so, face regulation issues and understanding from the local authorities of, of what you're actually doing here? Yeah, I think uh, the CNI side of renewable energy is. You could say in the early, very early stages of uh, you know, getting people to understand what it's all about. And sometimes you see that the regulations don't make sense. Uh, some of the some of the permits and licenses uh, that uh, that are currently in place uh, literally show stoppers if you take it to the uh, you know the black and white of it. Uh, for example, in India, you might need to completely change the categorization of your. Um, a mall would be classified as a factory simply for putting uh, a rooftop uh, solar panels. So, I mean, these <laughs> things have to change because with, with it being labeled as a factory comes a whole lot of other requirements. So, yeah, I mean, the, the pace at which regulations are moving, especially in the countries we are in, are uh, very much either non-existent or nascent or not enforced. Uh, in the CNI side of the business. Uh, so it's very important that uh, investors uh, firstly speak to each other. Uh, I think it's very important, like for companies like BCIS, we have a few investors. So it's important that for us, we speak together and understand what are the issues in the markets we are facing, uh, rather than having it linear, you know, as a linear model from, uh, from investor to investee. Mm. Uh, so that we understand the risks of this portfolio specifically and what can be done on a on a on a on a case to case basis not as a not as a as a project project but as on a portfolio level um, where the gaps are on uh, mm. on the on the uh, on the compliance level with regard to the laws and how long is that journey going to take to go, get to the IFC level uh, compliance, which is yeah. very far off, really. Mm. Um, and most of the time, it's at the start of uh, you know, the investment that that's, that's requested yeah. of us. So, yeah, because yeah. that's when we, I mean, we, we come in as an owner yes. in BC, in yes. IS, we're on the board. Uh, yes. uh, where do you see our role then as an active owner in this early oh, I, stages of, of, of investing in a company such as yours? Honestly, uh, speaking, BCS has been very, very uh, fundamental to helping me um, uh, work with uh, bettering the ENS uh, management through the company. The, the, we've been partners, literally, the team with, uh, with uh, Norfund. Um, right from the very early days, uh, they've been very uh, understanding of the issues we faced and providing solutions uh, as to how we can uh, ease into, you know, getting to a particular uh, target. So yes, I would say it's, uh, it's been very 
it's been it's been a very good journey working with uh, with Norfund. Uh, of course, I can say the same for with uh, with our other investors and board members as well. Um, with regard to uh, compliance, however, I mean you can see in the last three years there's been a lot of changes also in the markets that we have uh, worked in. It's been rapidly changing with regulations, uh, so uh, there's obviously that iterations that need to go on uh, with the, the changing laws also. And that's something also we need to keep abreast of continually, because it's not one of those established industries. Yeah. Helen, you tried to dodge me earlier and say that <laughs> it's not a dilemma. You can do both. And, but uh, is, is there some uh, risk here of us ending up being labeled as hypocrites uh, for coming from the West and saying, and I, well, it's, yeah, I mean, you can fix it. I mean, Norway has been accused of being hip hypocrisy, of hypocrisy when it comes to our being a fossil fuel exporter and then demanding that you mm. all do renewables. And I mean, we have put 90% of our waterfalls in, in, in pipes, and now we're telling them, don't destroy your nature. Is, 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 there, there are some re real dilemmas for the local governments, and at least perceived as, as that as the local governments. Are, are we being a hypocrite? <coughs> No, I don't, I don't. I think Norway as a country, yes, we are hypocrite. <laughs> we are, because we know we have gotten the message from Antonio, Antonio Guterres that you shouldn't invest more into oil and gas. No new investments. You shouldn't look for new oil and gas. We continue to do it, and we are quite proud of it as a nation when we're talking abroad. So, yes, we are hypocrites on that. And I think every country should tell Norway that. And you have to stand for your choices, uh, as you do when you are in government on that. You can't hide behind it. And the other side, when we are now kind of contributing to investment in renewable energy, I think what we perceive or think here in Norway isn't that important. It's what locally it uh, seems. And in many of these countries, yes, there is a need for development. You want job creation. You want value creation, economic uh, development. But at the same time, you have really strong communities that wants to take care of nature and not to do the mistake that we have done. Because it doesn't make sense to build down fresh water sites when we know the biggest loss of biodiversity in the world ha has happened in connection with fresh water. And we know that fresh water is going to be a limited resource going forward, particularly with climate change is happening faster. And the biggest threat to nature right now is a habitat loss or damage of habitat. And then climate change comes as the biggest threat or fastest growing threat on top of the other challenges for nature. So we have to take that into account. But I think it's unfair to assume that they're going to just do the same mistakes as we did, because it was mistakes, a lot of the things we do. With the information and knowledge we have today, I'm pretty sure that many of the things we had done in Norway wouldn't happen. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do investment or do something, thing, or not do anything, but we should do something different. And that's what I'm saying. Okay, so big, taking kind of big freshwater resources, building that into energy, does that make sense? Well, you have to look at the local context. Um, and if not, how can you build up an uh, energy system that fits that country in terms of the development and where they are going, if it's off-grid, if it's more micro, um, in uh, having not every kind of village integrated into one grid, uh, building factory development close in current infrastructure in cities where you want or in harbor. So it's really changing kind of really doesn't matter how much what we think here in Norway. It matters what they think in these countries. And I can promise you that WBF in these countries are working really hard to get this a civil society voice and taking, yes. saying no to oil and gas. We have to jump over that. We can't, we can't afford to do that. That will destroy our natural resources in this country. So we need to have renewable. But we don't just don't want to kind of copy paste previously projects done elsewhere. We have to find what works here, and investors should pay what the cost, the real cost, not just kind of saying, oh, well, we are going to make profit of it as well. Taking the real cost, nature, how does that drive local communities, and so on. Nella, when you bring these things up in, in, in discussions on our investments, do you, uh, do you feel like, uh, uh, like we're demanding too much, uh, or, or, do, or do you feel that like you're met with understanding on these issues? Well, I mean, you mean internal, your North Fund, or when we're no, discussing these two? Developers or the <laughs> to developers. governments and, and I mean, no, um, people in poverty who wants energy, and they want it fast. 
Um, I feel that it depends. I mean, like every project is different. Every context is going to be different. I've, I've also, you know, encountered companies that have already, that are already very, you know, advanced in regards to sustainability. They get it. They already have their systems in place, as well as some governments, and they understand the value that having these practices brings to their company or to their project. But I've also encountered other situations in which uh, maybe the project company doesn't really understand, and it takes a while and a long time to handhold this company to really ensure that, first of all, they understand why these practices are very important. I mean, it's not only because we as Northfund are coming there and asking them, you need to do this, this, and that, and, and check the box. And I think many of the companies that haven't started that sustainability journey at the beginning really don't get the added value. And uh, I think I'm kind of a living example of that. I used to work at a renewable energy company many years ago that had uh, money from DFIs. And I think at the beginning, the company was doing all these best practices because they were required to do these best practices. But the company started to grow very quickly. Yeah. And we were building projects in Latin America that it's a very complex environment to, to be investing in. So I think throughout the years, the company really understood why it was important to spend money you know, in hiring staff that is talking to the communities and not only be talking to communities one time, just maintain that relationship throughout the years. Why is it important to invest in you know, uh, studies that are going to give you information in regards to livelihoods or biodiversity? Because at the end, if you don't have that, your projects are not going to be viable. Or at one time, the, you know, something is going to happen and you're going to be in the middle of a huge conflict. So I think it's, um, we play a, a fundamental role in that as a DFI. And I was going back to, to the previous session on, on impact and how these stories somehow get lost in the way when you're just trying to be more quantitative on showing your mm -hmm. impact. But I do think that all this impact, I mean, yes, as I said, I come from that. And I saw the change in that company. And I saw how throughout the years it became one of the leading renewable energy companies in the region, really doing business the right way. And also myself, when I started working there, I didn't know anything about IFC performance standards or this international best practices. And I was part of you know, that problem that you highlighted, that it's difficult also to find staff with the adequate knowledge in, this in these biggest. geographies. But at the end, I was able to learn as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah this is what you were uh, noting too also, the, the need for this yeah, I think the it's, competence. Yeah, it's, I think we have to take more time to develop you know, the human capital, social capital, natural capital, understand these issues locally. Mm. Uh, as investors, this localized understanding is very critical. Business has to be done more intuitively. Currently, we, we are going by checklists, we are going by principles and criteria, we are going through uh, World Bank criteria. Uh, it's, it's all good, it's, it's the starting stage, but we need to get to an intuitive stage. Um, there are many ways to do that, but I guess we're running out of time, so I would <laughs> start on that, but there's, there's more, yes. Thank you very much, all of you, for a very interesting discussion. I can... I think I, I've learned something at least about uh, how to handle some of these challenges and dilemmas. And I, I think the, it's, uh, it's hopeful to see some examples of how it can be done uh, as we really need to hurry up and, 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 and reach our goals when it comes to scaling up renewables. Thank you. <laughs>